I'm going to play another song while the others are joining us. One of the things about prophecy, prophets, and the prophetic is that the prophetic ministry, for some reason, seem to attract attention, and a lot of times the attention is toxic and negative, and for the most part, the individual is called a false prophet. It just happens that way because when the Lord speaks, He is way ahead of His time, and you're telling people things that are way ahead of the times, and they can't see it. And they look at you like you're goo goo gaga. <laughs> you have lost your mind. And some of them will tell you to your face. Others will twist your words deliberately, maliciously, and add to what you said. And most people don't have the discernment 
and secondly they're way too lazy to check up what you really said and then to measure it with what the individual is blaming you for saying and most people don't have that kind of discipline so they just take rumors whoever comes first with a story that's the story they believe to be the truth when you come second or third they think you're a liar because if you were telling the truth you would have come first number one fear of confrontation is the enemy of a prophet if you have a prophetic ministry you cannot be afraid of confrontation you're gonna have it in droves you're gonna have confrontation in exodus chapter 7 verse 15 the lord tells uh moses go to pharaoh the worst thing that you could tell him that's where he did not want to go go to pharaoh go in the morning as he goes out to the river he likes to go worshiping them crocodiles confront him on the bank of the nile confront him you're going for a confrontation with the king and you know that's not going to sit well with pharaoh because men have ego and uh, politicians men who are in charge of nation they have a bigger ego they have a god complex and they assume that what they say must go and everybody must bow down and say, Thou Excellency, yeah, 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 yeah. And so the Lord says, I want you to go by the river. He's going to go there in the morning. And I want you to confront him. Confront him by the Nile. And take in your hand your staff, which changed into a snake. <laughs> Exodus 7 and 15. Confront him. Fear of confrontation is the enemy of any prophetic voice. If you're afraid of men's person, and if you're afraid to tell them what thus said the Lord, you're not going to be too much of a prophet. You'll be a $2 prophet. You're fit for nothing. In Ezekiel chapter 16 and verse 2, the Lord tells Ezekiel, Son of man, <laughs> here's that word again, confront Jerusalem with her detestable practices. Ezekiel 16 and 2. And a lot of Christian preachers, they, get, they take offense. One man told me bluntly, he said, you can't call the president by his name. You can't say his first name. His name is to be, rever you know, you have to have some awe and reverence. Now, I understand that you have to respect the office, but you tell me I can't call the man's name? And he said, no. And he was, uh, he was offended when I called the president's name. Well, don't you all call the president of America's name with such disdain and distaste? And his favor as a curse word. Don't you all call him that because the media told you how to call him? You, you do. Don't pretend with me now. At some point, you're going to have to confront issues and confront people. You cannot, as a leader of a nation, pretend to be a Christian while you're leading the nation into idolatry. And the preachers are afraid. And because you call his name out, they're, they're upset with you. No, there's no time for that. We are going to give an account to God. For allowing certain wickedness in the land when we should have raised our voice and spoken, we didn't say a thing because we, we have respect of persons and we have an inordinate affection. Caribbean people on the, on the whole and my people in my nation in general, they have almost a, a worshipful attitude towards politicians who lie to them all the time. And yet, they would have this reverential awe like these men can do no wrong. I always smile and chuckle when I hear them say, His Excellency. And these men are, you know, they are men. The best of men are men at best. The best of men are men at best. Full of flaws. And in the case of our people, full of wickedness. Inundated with it. And the reason for that is the preachers are afraid of their own shadow. And they would not say a word and they're upset with you for saying a word like oh you think you're better than us fear of confrontation is the enemy of any voice for god you cannot be a voice of god if you're afraid of confrontation now listen to this in uh, john chapter 8 and verse 48 the jews answered we say you are a samaritan we say a demon is making you crazy are we not right when we say that? They call him a Samaritan, an outsider. 
Isn't that what they call those of us who live in the foreign nations? Y'all go foreign and y'all won't come here and tell we what to do. The only thing they seem to want from you is your money. And they prefer U.S. You tell them you live in Canada, they don't like that. We want U.S. or pounds. And then they want you to shut up. Don't say a thing because this is our nation. Last time I checked, it was our nation too. I have a passport for that. That says, I man born ya. I man grow ya. Me go leave ya. Me go go up a rica. <laughs> Come out of your caves. You got that right. Prophets are sometimes accused of being crazy and having a devil. Don't, don't, don't be shocked when they think you're demon possessed. And they tell you you're walking over here. <laughs> oh boy. Jesus was called a Samaritan and accused of having a devil. Prophets are often called rebellious. Yeah, I've been called that. Religious, I've been called that. Deep, I've been called that. Spooky, I've been called that. Crazy, I've been called that. Especially by a religious system that, that are confronted with the truth. When you confront them with the truth, they take offense. You can't say things like that. You will bring prosecution on the church. From who? In John 8 and 48, they call Jesus a Samaritan. The woman of Samaria, the woman, she left she water pot and she gone. And she said, come see a man who told me all that I have done. She left she water pot and she gone. The woman, the woman, the woman, she left she water pot and she gone. The woman of Samaria, the woman, she left she water pot and she gone. They called Jesus a Samaritan because he treated the woman with some level of dignity. Good night, Nichelle. You're going to be accused by people who don't get you. They don't get the message that you bring. They, they are offended. We say you are a Samaritan. We say you have a demon. We say it's making you crazy. Are we not right when we say this? And they're in his face telling him that. You're crazy. You have a demon. You're a Samaritan. You're not a Jew. You don't belong here. Don't speak for us. In John chapter 8 and verse 52, then the Jews said to him, they're talking to Jesus, now we know that you have a demon. <laughs> we know that you have a demon. Abraham and the prophets died and you say, if a man keep my word, he shall never taste death. Now we know that you have a demon. They couldn't figure out what he was saying. And they didn't ask him for clarification. They believed the liars out there who said, he said this, he said that, he said that. No. My grandmother told me a thing. She said, son, get it from the horse's mouth. Don't ever believe he says she say. Go and ask the person to their face. You're a man, aren't you? Yes, granny. Go and ask the person to their face. Don't worry with all of these people that he says she say. Be man enough to go talk to the person yourself. And granny is right. Lots of times I've gone to talk to the horse. And the horse told a different story. And the horse was telling the truth. Now, the, the next thing is, after they have called you false prophet, and after you've overcome your fear of confrontation, they're going to tell you, judge not. <laughs> this society in particular, they don't like anything that's in disagreement with what they, how they want to live. They say, judge not, and that is to shut you down. You got arachnophobia, you got Islamophobia, you got Christophobia, you got xenophobia and they throw these words that end in phobia to make you feel like i better not have any phobia so i better shut up no open your mouth like a trumpet give the winds a mighty voice let the redeemed of the lord say so jesus was referring to a critical condemning fault finding nitpicking self-righteous spirit of outer judgment because people are going to use judge not in the biblical phrase to shut the mouth of the prophets. The biblical reference to judge not does not mean that wickedness and evil should not be exposed and confronted. 
Jesus is referring to unrighteous judgment and not righteous judgment. He exposed and rebuked the Pharisees for their wickedness. And in Matthew 7 and 1, do not judge and criticize and condemn others so that you may not be judged and criticized and condemned yourselves. Do not judge according to appearances. That's what it meant. But practice righteous judgment, John 7 and 24. Don't judge according to appearances. Many times I walk through malls in North America and uh, if I'm passing some other race of people, they, they, they hold on their bags real tight and sometimes I laugh and they get even more scared. <laughs> they think you're coming to steal from them. You go into a store, they leave everybody else and they come over to you. Is there anything I can help you with, sir? Oh no, I'm, I'm looking to the shoe department, I'm going straight to the shoe department. And if I see a shoe that I like, then, then I'll, uh, I'll take it up to the, to the cashier and I leave. And they'll come back a second or a third time. Is there anything I can help you with? I said, no. If you ask me that again, I will leave your store and I will not buy a shoe. Oh, sorry, sir. Go ask the white guy over there if he has anything that you can help him with. You're not asking him. Why are you asking me three times? I told you no the first time. Oh, you black people always angry and have an attitude. I have no attitude. Why are you asking me three times? They are judging according to appearance. They assume that because you look like this, you have to be a thief or a shoplifter. That devil is a liar and so is his mother-in-law and all of his stepchildren. Jesus, in talking about judging here, he is referring to the critical, condemning, fault-finding, nitpicking, self-righteous spirit of outer judgment and judging according to appearances. You have to make a judgment every day. You have to judge. Am I going to buy this thing? Am I going to do this thing? Am I going to go to am I going to speed up? Am I going to slow down? Am I going to go above the speed limit in the school zone? Am I going to let my feet be soft on the on the gas? Do I pass this guy on the highway? Do I take this exit here? You're making judgments every day. So don't say judge not. You have to judge. The Bible says judge righteous judgment. But the point I'm making is uh, when people can't shut you down in other ways, they're going to use this scripture here, judge not that you be not judged. Because they want to do their evil and they want you to remain silent or even join them in their wickedness. And the minute you say, no, that's not what the scripture teaches, or, oh, you know, you're judging me. I don't, you don't judge, Rev. You have no love. <laughs> They're quick to tell you you're not a Christian and you have no love. Because they want to be evil and they want you to be a participant of their evil. No, we're not going to play that role. Now, the next thing is, apart from these confrontations and accusations, you're going to have opposition and hardship. Opposition and hardship. Oh, this is a very negative message you bring in here tonight. No, this is not negative. This is preparatory. I'm preparing you because the spirit of prophecy is going to be released and is being released in the world your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and I'm warning you up front so that when it happens to you, you will know that this is just normal. It's not strange. People are going to call you these names. As long as you're mousy quiet and you don't make waves, they're happy with you. But the minute you become a voice for God, watch that demonic confrontation is going to happen. You don't, you don't have to be nasty. But you have to be nice and firm. They love the nice, but they hate the form. When you take a stand, oh, you're just a hater. No, nobody's a hater here. When parents tell their children to do the right thing, say morning, say good afternoon, say excuse me, say pardon me, say thank you. You're training them. You're not being a hater. Because if they go out in life on a job, in the form that they're going to work with, with that toxic attitude of ill-mannered behavior, they're going to be fired. You're not being a hater by training them to do the right thing, to say the right thing. No, you're being a parent. You're going to have hardship and difficulty. I'm telling you up front. I'm not going to lie to you. You're going to have hardship and you're going to have difficulty. Demons hate prophets and so they're going to stir people up to persecute you. Witches and warlocks hate prophets. Jezebel hated the prophets of God. And prophets are a threat to the works of darkness because they point you to the light. 
And when that prophetic voice, when that trumpet has a certain song, people don't like that certain song. As long as you say, Jesus, take the wheel, they're happy with you. But when you say, there's a time for peace and there's a time for war. There's a time to pick up stones and there's a time to cast away stones. There's a time to lie down and there's a time to stand up. There's a time to go tell Herod that fox. There's a time to go tell Pharaoh, let my people go, that they will serve me. There's a time to confront wicked leaders in business, politics, and in the church. There's a time for that. You can't just let them get by and get off with it. You call yourself an archbishop and you giving day trip drugs to women all over the place. You call yourself a prophet and an evangelist, soul, 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 and you want women to strip naked so you can lay hands and pray for them. You can't pray for them with their clothes on because you're that deep and anointed. You call yourself a pope and look what you're doing. Oh yes, you get upset now. These rascals need to be confronted. They are not men of God. They are wicked spirits are leading and guiding them and anointing them to do all kinds of provocation in the house of God. And the ministers are allowing it. These vindictive people, after they made a deal with you, now they're saying they're going to give you back the money because they want to charge triple and quadruple for it, but they're not going to tell X on that. 2% can't work. They're not going to say that. Oh, oh, Rev, you know, you can't say that. They're going to put your name on the blacklist. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. You're going to have to handle hardship and opposition. Prophets are the enemies of wickedness. But God protects his prophets. God sustains his prophets. Don't be fooled and be afraid of the enemy. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Oh, rock a shocker now. No weapon that is formed against you shall prosper. Don't you quote that scripture all the time? Oh, yes. And every tongue that rises up against you in judgment you shall condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of God, and their vindication is from me, says the Lord. What? The Lord will vindicate you. The Lord will vindicate you. The Lord will vindicate you. That man is nothing but the false prophets of revelation. In 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 4, when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, Obadiah took a hundred prophets and hid them in the groups. Of 50 in a cave and fed them bread and water now bread and water is not anything fancy schmancy it's just ordinary basic survival mode bread and water bread and water the church does have a voice if the men of God will speak but they roar like lions in their in their congregation but when they come out of there they meow like a pussycat See them in the church all day roaring. I rebuke the devil. See when they come out. Meow. They have a voice if they will use it. I'm tired of the voiceless church. Tired of the cowardly church. Tired of it. You're afraid of death. You're going to die sometime. It is appointed unto men once to die. So Obadiah fed the prophets with bread and water. Now for those of us who... Who pick and choose what we feel like eating and eat what we feel like eating. There was a time you ate what was there. And there's a time in your life when you eat what you want to eat. Not what is there. If you don't like what is there, you, you go get something else. But there's a time when you're not going to get something else. And sometimes you're not going to even get what is there. You're going to have to break down to bread and water. I warn you again, get your fork and get your kitchen garden going. Every person who lives in a tropical country should have a kitchen garden. It's a shame that I had to come all the way out here to figure that out. But I had my kitchen garden back in the day. I always had something growing somewhere. But now you've got to take it more seriously because that time is coming. Oh, rock a shocker. So the prophets had bread and water. And for some people, that is hardship. They're not accustomed to... Eating one thing for weeks and weeks and weeks, bread and water. You have got to train yourself to be tougher than you are, Christian people. And stop murmuring and complaining when you don't have your way. Train yourself to be tough. Learn to fast and pray. Learn to live on the basics. There are sometimes I go on what I call a clothing fast. What is that? 
I am buying no new clothes for this entire year. I am buying none. I've got enough. I've just alternate them, switch them, switch them up, switch them up, and save my money for something more important. Black people like to go around with too much bling, and they like to change too much clothes, and all of their assets is on their assets. Yeah, you heard me. Too much dressy, too much flash, too much of everything. Spending on here, spending on nails. Come on, y'all. Where is your property? Where is your property? Where is your property? You will get all this bling and stuff after you have gotten your property. Where do you live? Well, you can't talk to people like that. I just did. Our people are too flashily dressed and too much bling all the time. And they're not doing much of anything with their money besides buy and eat, buy and eat, buy and eat. And the people that you're buying and eating from, they're promising to, to poison the greens. And you're still going and buy from them with your crazy self. Come on, y'all. Soon as you get paid, two days after you're broke. Everybody else saving up. What about you? Do something significant with your money and stop spending while. Oh, I just felt the heckle on my jekyll. Hmm. In 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 9, Cabo Shanda, hey, hey. God sustains his prophets. Don't be afraid of them that can kill the body but can't kill the soul. And always remember, the person who is threatening you, they're not the only one who has a hand. You have a hand too. And you ought to protect yourself and protect your family. Hintawashiba make baniba take notice. My mother used to say that all the time. God sustains prophets. They don't need to depend on men. Or a religious system to survive. Prophets should depend on God. They must be free to speak for the Lord. They must be free to speak for the Lord. True prophets don't eat at Jezebel's table. In 1 Kings 17 and 9, the Lord says, Go to Zarephath and live there. There's a widow that will sustain you. A widow of all the people for God to choose to sustain you. A widow. When he went there, she was on her last meal and about to die. He had the word that will multiply the barrel of meal and the cruise of oil. People are going to threaten you. I had a woman over here when I came here to live. She threatened me one time and she said, if you keep preaching, I, I can't recall what subject I was, I think I was dealing with the Jezebel spirit and I was, I was doing it for one month. And she took offense. She said, if you don't stop teaching that subject, I will leave. And not only will I leave the church, I will take my family and friends with me and um, the, the rental for this building, you will not be able to pay the rental because me and my family, we, we give tithes and offering and our money help to pay the rent. And if, if we don't pay the rent, if we don't give the money, if we leave, you will be unable to pay the rent and you will have to close down the church. This sister is threatening the man of God with closing down the church if I don't stop preaching and teaching on Jezebel. And I kept teaching. Don't let people hold you to ransom. Many times people push money in my hand. The Lord said, don't take it. I said, no, I don't want it. He said, but Rev, you don't know how much. I said, I don't care how much it is. I don't want it. Look, let me tell you something about money. Anytime money is passed, they, listen to me carefully. Every time money is passed, an exchange is made. I'm talking to you people in ministry in particular now. And there are times when people will give you money to buy your silence. That's not what they're telling you, but they're giving you money to buy your silence, to make you shut up when they're in that congregation sitting there. They'll give you the stink eye to tell you they don't like where you're going with this message. And because they put $2 in your hand, you've got to soften your approach and be very politically correct. When money exchanges hands and you take from them or you whatever, an exchange occurs. They give you something. You are, even when you think you're not giving them something, you are giving them something. Some of the essence of you is passed on to them. Now, there are times when you pass it on freely of your own will because you have this nice vibe that this person is not trying to bribe you. They are sowing into what they see God doing in your life and they want to be a participant. They want some of that anointing to come on what they are dealing with. And so they gave out of a free heart. 
But uh, there are people that want to buy your silence. They're bribing you by giving you what they're giving you. And so sometimes you have to say no. There are some churches that I've preached at. When they give the honorarium, the Lord said, don't take it. I said, no. The Lord said, don't take it. Oh, you didn't hear from the Lord. I <laughs> Look, I must know when I hear from the Lord. I know the Lord said, don't take it. But you didn't even ask how much it is. And then they'll tell me, it's a nice figure. The Lord said, don't take it. I said, no. The Lord said, don't take it. Do you have something against us, Rev? No, the Lord said don't take it. Don't you want me to obey the Lord? Oh, yes, 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 yes. But I don't think the Lord spoke to you. I know the Lord spoke to me. He said don't take it. And usually some old saint within that week, some old saint who was not even at the service will come to the place I'm staying at and said, the Lord woke me up this morning and said I should give this to you. And it's more than what the church was giving. <laughs> I said, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Now go walk on gold. He said, what do you mean by that? May fortune follow you and lead you and guide you everywhere you go. May you walk on gold. He said, oh, okay, okay, all right. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. When money... I was in a certain island. A woman came to the service dressed in white. And she had an envelope in her hand. And the pastor touched me on the shoulder and he said, you see that woman dressed in white there? I said, yes. He said, what do you think about her? I said, she's a witch. He said, yes. Don't take anything from her. I said, all right. The man of God warned me. So that night, nothing happened. She came the second night. And this time she walked right up to me and she pushed the thing, an envelope in my pocket. I opened the envelope later on. There was a brand spanking new hundred US dollar bill in that envelope. I forgot about what the pastor said the previous night. Don't take anything from her. So when everything was done, those days I used to sell uh, cassettes and CDs and yeah, 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 yeah. And in that particular island, they don't buy one. They buy one of each and they buy it twice. So if you got 10 CDs, they buy 20, 10 for themselves and 10 for a friend. And so it was a very good situation. And when I left that place, I had thousands of dollars in my jacket pocket that I'm traveling from that island back to my country back then. I wasn't living in Canada yet. When I touched down at the airport on, in my country and I pushed my hand to get the envelope out with the thousands of US dollars, there was not a cent in my coat the envelope was gone. The envelope with the 100 US was gone as well. All of the money is the most mysterious thing I have ever encountered. All of the money vanished. Vanished! Oh, Rev, you dropped it. No! I made sure that night, I put the jacket on the bed, I put the money in there, in the pocket, and I was tapping it all. You know how you... <laughs> you know how is it when you've got a good stash, you're tapping it to make sure it's there. Everywhere. Through the airport, I tapped it. Go on the plane. I tapped it. It was there. I went into the washroom of the plane to release some blessing and tapped it. It was there. Came out of the washroom, tapped it. It was there. Went in, the, in my seat and sat down. Tapped it. It was there. So I picked up the magazine in the plane and I'm reading this, that, and you know, those magazines that talk about what and what, this, this plane and, and this island and this Calypso music, this new fashionista. Yeah, 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 I'm reading, reading. And then when I got done, I closed the magazine and I was going to go take a little sleep and give it a final tap. When I tapped, I felt my chest. I pushed my hand in my pocket. And my heart started pounding. I mean, it was like a spirit of terror was on me. My heart started pounding. My hands, my palm, the palm of my hand, in here started sweating. And my heart was beating like I had run a marathon. The money was gone. An exchange took place when that woman handed that whatever she withdrew from me. She withdrew virtue A and every dime that I had worked for for that week. In that, in that situation. A withdrawal takes place. She was giving that to get back that. That I had earned. 
It vanished from my inside pocket. Oh, I don't believe that, Rev. You coming up with these stories, you always got some funny story. I'm just telling you the truth. The money was gone. I never told that pastor a word because how are you going to tell the man of God that, uh, you know, you forgot and the witch give you a hundred the next night and, and your money disappeared on the plane? You say, well, it fell down. Look, the jacket had no holes in it. Retrace your steps. I did that too. <laughs> the next time I went back to that island, here she comes sauntering up to me again, smiling. And when she reached a certain distance, I put out my hand like a stoplight. Stop right there. And I said to her, the trick that you pulled the last time, it's not going to work this time. She looked like somebody had shot her in the head. She got pink, 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 pink. And then she gave me a smile, a wicked, evil smile. Her eyes looked like coals of fire. And she, she, just one minute ago, she was smiling. And then the next minute, she was full. I could feel the hate coming out of her. So you're not going to try that this time around, lady. And I was staring her down, at, you know, like, give me my money. <laughs> I never got it back, but that lesson will never leave me. When, you, when, when money is handed over and exchange is made, not every honorarium is to be received. Not every person that tries to bless you, you must receive that blessing. Not every gift that somebody is giving you, you must receive that gift. Some people are setting a trap to make a withdrawal, pull all the virtue out of you, and leave you a shell of yourself. There are some gifts that if you receive them, you will never be the powerful preacher that you are right now. You just, you just take it to the bank. I don't believe you. You don't have to. When you're pitiful and powerless, you will remember these words. And then you can come to me. And when you come, bring an offering too. And I'll get rid of that thing that has gotten you now in its grip. Because I knew what to do to get rid of it from me. And one of the things to do is never take money all over the place willy-nilly just because somebody is giving it to you. See, you, you, you depend on the Lord to know? Yes. Yes. Now, most people are genuine when they're giving. But you got these few rascals. They are out to suck the virtue and to... Yeah, I did. Look. Look. If I tell you the whole story, it's going to take all night. So I've got to leave that alone. But suffice it to say, she got a whip in the likes of which she had not expected right in, the, in, the, in that church that night. Elijah was fed by ravens. That was the source and his provider. Prophets depend on God for sustenance. They need God's sustenance because they are often rejected by men. You're going to face rejection. You're going to face rejection. But expect to receive miraculous provision from God too. Expect rejection and expect God to take care of you. In 1 Kings 18 and 19, Now send word out and gather for me all Israel and Mount Carmel, along with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. 850 false prophets were fed by Jezebel. They could no longer speak for God because Jezebel had them in her grip, in her grasp. When men of God are being fed by the political system of the day, they can no longer be a voice of God. I have rarely seen a preacher involved and engaged in the political arena who didn't lose his credibility and his good name because of the rascality of the people that he's with and he remains quiet in the face of all kinds of wickedness. He loses his voice for God because he has now become a puppet for men. Jezebel had 850 prophets and she was feeding them. And the real men of God were being persecuted and killed and hunted down like the vagabonds of the day. Hmm. In 1 Kings 18 and 13, were you not told what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? Now notice the prophets of the Lord were killed by Jezebel. How I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets in groups of 50 in a cave and fed them bread and water. All of God's servants will not be killed. Some of them will live in spite of Jezebel. Not all Jezebels can, uh, can kill you off. Sometimes the Lord will preserve you. Sometimes you're going to have to blind some of them that come against you. Literal blindness. Like the sorcerer that went feeling for somebody to take him home because Paul blinded his sorry donkey. God hates when his true prophets are mistreated. And sometimes they are persecuted, ignored, 
They are called crazy. They are rejected. They are overlooked. They are isolated. They are muzzled. They are passed over. Persecuted by the system that they cry out against. This is nothing new. But God vindicates his prophets. He defends them. And he deals with the system that mistreats them. Saying, touch not the Lord's anointed and do my prophets no harm. Psalm 105 and verse number 15. In Jeremiah 37 and 4. Now Jeremiah was still coming in and going out among the people. For they had not yet put him into prison. <laughs> They're going to jail Jeremiah, the real man of God. When the prophetic anointing starts to come upon your life, expect that some of the invitations will cut off completely, totally and permanently. When the prophetic anointing is released upon your life and you say what the Lord says, expect to lose some ministry friends. Expect them to join the ranks of your enemy and to join in and, and, and say things against you in the public square. I was shocked one day. Somebody called me and said, Rev, what have you done to Reverend so-and-so? I said, what are you talking about? Me and that guy is good friends. I said, that's what you're saying, but I know you're lying. I said, excuse me? He said, check so-and-so page, check so-and-so name, and look down on that scroll. Scroll down, you'll see the man that you're calling your friend. He's cussing you off on this guy's page, and this guy is cussing you off and calling you every false prophet in the book. So I thought the person was lying. I said, come on now. Me and that guy, we are friends. We type. We are like that. We are two peas in a pod, bud and, uh, you know, bud and Mutt and Jeff, Bud and Lou, Heckle and Jekyll, Frick and Frack. When I went on this page, I got cold. And I saw this friend of mine, man of God, joining in with this, this man who doesn't know what Hinduism is and what uh, Jandi Bambu is. And the man was cussing me and he was cussing me too. My friend, my familiar friend. So I called him up and said, yo dog, hey, it's me. I just saw the thing that you put. On the man's page what's that about oh i didn't know the man was talking about you say so you, you're gonna lie now by the time i went back a minute later the thing was gone but it was too late to apologize too late i found out that day how that man of god saw me so quick to go out in the public space and cuss you off what is that about you're going to lose some people that you started off with, that you middled with. They're going to run past you with the baton that you're supposed to run with and give it to somebody else. They're going to call you an unclean thing and cast out your name as an unclean thing. You're going to lose friends. Just put that in your pipe and smoke it. You're going to lose friends. Good friends that you've done nothing to. You've done them no wrong. And they're talking about you like a dog every chance they get. Prophets are going to be persecuted. They are going to be mistreated. They are going to be ignored. They are going to be called crazy. They are going to be overlooked, isolated, muzzled, passed over, rejected, persecuted by the system that they cry against. This is nothing new, but God vindicates his prophets. He defends them and he deals with the system that mistreats them. You are going to have your licks. You are going to have the school of hard knocks beat up on your head. Church hurt is one of the worst hurts that there is. Church hurt is one of the worst hurts that there is. Church, church hurt is one of the worst hurts that there is. Some people got friends and some people got frenemies. Now that I know how the brother saw me, I know how to treat, how to deal, you know. Sins are forgiven and everything else, but guess what? I'm not taking a chance with you again. Now listen, this is my final set of words here. If you are a prophet, you will have to develop some roughness, some toughness, some spine. You're going to have to take that jelly out of your back and throw it away and put some steel in your backbone. You've got to be prepared to put on the camels here and eat locusts and wild honey. Now locust is not an insect, it's a fruit. This same John had clothing made of camels here, a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey, Matthew 3 and 4. You have got to be tough. Endure hardness as a good soldier is an admonition in the scripture. You must be tough 
strong enough to withstand adverse conditions. Or you've got to be strong enough to handle rough or careless handling. You're going to have to learn to... <laughs> you're going to have to learn to withstand adverse conditions and rough and careless handling. There are a lot of people in the church world that handle ministers of the gospel rough. And there are some people, I warned them, I said, you know, you've got to be careful with your careless way that you treat people. I warned you ten times, don't call me that name, you keep calling me that name. You're careless, and you call that one more time. And I'll just say hi to you, I'll never speak to you again, just hi and, and bye. Because you are a disrespectful person, you've got to stop. Everybody doesn't like to be told certain things and they tell you to stop it and you keep doing it you're very disrespectful and you need to stop and sometimes they're shocked like because you you're doing them a favor because they're going to go through life telling people things that hurt them and when people leave their sorry donkey and stop dealing with them then they have the nerve to say they're being persecuted for righteousness it's not righteousness it's stupidity on your part you know somebody doesn't like something don't do it to them stop it you're too careless with the way you treat people. I've gone to places where people invited me to come speak. They invited me. I, I never invited myself to any church. And I've never asked any church to invite me. In the 41 years that I'm a preacher, I've never asked any church to invite me. And I've never invited myself. So now I'm at the airport. And they're going to call my wife and tell her, uh, call me and tell me they're going to be late. We're talking like two, three hours late. Well, who invited who here? You were expecting me, and two hours later, you haven't come to the airport. What's that about? That's very disrespectful. Because it's not the first time you have done this. You're careless. And then... When you take a decision to not go back to that careless house, they want to know what did they do you wrong? What what's hap what happened, Rev? What, why you're not you're not even saying anything to us? You're too careless, and uh, you need to have a loss to get you to come to your senses in how you treat God's people. And I will tell them. I said I always said to them, if I was a white man, you wouldn't do that. And he said, oh, oh, come on, Rev, come on, don't say that. And I'd say it again to them. If I were a white man, you wouldn't do that. I've seen how you treat our white brothers. You fawn over them, you laugh at their jokes. Even though they gave the joke last night and give it tonight, you're laughing louder tonight than last night. You heard it already and you're laughing twice. But your brothers that look like you, you treat them like crap. There's a lot of respect of persons that goes on in church. The color of your skin can get you through a lot of things, a lot of places. And some people get mistreated while others get treated like kings and gods. And I'm not talking about the world, I'm talking about the church. Oh boy, we got a lot of stuff to correct in the house of God. We got a lot of stuff to correct. And when you correct it, people get offended. But somebody's got to correct it. And the Lord has chosen me. <laughs> I ain't scared of you, you ain't scared of me Let's get it on If you want some, come get some But you better be willing to take some I told one person one time, said, you know Reverend, you know, remember when you were at our church We used to treat you real bad I said, yes I said, I said but that guy, that, that guy that used to treat bad He's dead now I said, what? I said, he's dead I said, but, but it's you I said, no, that guy That one that you knew then, he is dead I said, how, how do you know? I said, I kill him you're looking at a totally different species of being that never existed before. You can't try that with me now because I wouldn't take it from your sorry donkey. <laughs> you, when you tell people stuff blunt in their face, you know, they get nervous like, you're such an angry black man. No, I've got sense now. You're not going to treat me like crap and have me come around. I don't need to be here. I don't need persecution and affliction. I got food home and a nice king-size bear to sleep on. I'm not looking for a place in the sun. 
coming here is a sacrifice that I'm making. Appreciate it when God's people take time out to come and minister the word of God to you. Two hours late to pick them up. No. And then mad with me because I took a cab. Oh, you can't do that, Rev. How is it going to look? I don't care. I'll take a cab and come. That's why I like to know where I'm going. I like to know the address so I can arrive there in style in a cab. Nobody had to come for me because I don't trust you to come on time. You have shown before that you're unprofessional and careless in your dealings with the gift that God has sent to you. Oh, glory to God. Now listen. You've got to learn to shake off the dust. Shake off the dust. Everyone is not going to receive your ministry. They're not going to receive you. They're not going to receive the truth that you're telling them. Sometimes it just doesn't happen that way. You can't make people do what the Lord says they should do. The Lord can't make them do what He says they should do. Sometimes you have to learn to shake off the dust. In Matthew 10 and 14, the Bible says, Whosoever will, re will not receive you, nor hear your words, when you depart out of that house or city, shake off the dust from your foot. And you've got to be careful when you're rejected. Look, let me warn you on this. You've got to be careful when you feel rejected that you don't pick up the demon of hurt and rejection and let them come into your life and make you miserable. In 1 Samuel 8 and 7, here's God talking to Samuel. He said, Samuel, it is not you that they have rejected, but me that they have rejected from reigning over them. It's not about you, it's about the Lord. And so sometimes in ministry, Satan will deliberately orchestrate a misunderstanding. And one of you that are involved in the misunderstanding can, can get a spirit of offense towards that person. And every time you see them, you get angry. When you hear their name, you, 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 steam starts to come out of your ears and come out of your nose. You're mad again. You're forever the victim and forever angry when you see them or hear about them. Just their name gets you upset. You have a spirit of offense on you. You could hook them on a chandai all you want. You have a spirit of offense on you because every time that person's name is mentioned, you start to flare at the nose like a horse getting ready to run. You get angry and upset. You have a spirit of offense because you have not learned to be careful and to shake off all that stuff. And haven't you noticed that vital people that God has linked you with, you're cutting them out of your life like nobody's business because you are offended by something that they said or something that they did or something that you think they said or something that you think they did. Watch that spirit of offense. Be very cautious. Be very careful. If they reject the word that you brought and they call you a false prophet, it's not your word to begin with. The postman doesn't get upset because the people are crying because a bill came. He is not the one giving them the bill. He would not profit when the bill is paid. He's just the postman. You're just the, the delivery boy. I am just the delivery boy. And so once I've given the message, I go on about my business. If they don't receive it, I tell them, I'm sorry for your loss. But when this thing happens, and it's going to happen, don't say I didn't tell you so. And sometimes I'll call them months later and say, uh, I don't want to say I told you so, but... Um, I told you so. <laughs> and they say, Rev, you know, man, I couldn't see how this thing was going to happen. But um, I hope you don't feel any way. I hope you'd come back if I invite you. <laughs> Hallelujah. You've got to be sensitive to the voice of God and to the people of God. When you start to deal with the prophetic aspect of your calling, and you all have a prophetic calling, I read the scripture last night. Paul said, I would that you all would prophesy. I hear that you speak in tongues, but I would rather or I would prefer that you prophesy. And then he said, speaking in tongues should lead to prophecy. Because when you speak in tongues, you edify yourself. And an edified man can now become a prophetic man because the Spirit of the Lord can come on him in that mode of edification as he worships and praises the Lord for the good things that he has done. God inhabits the praise. God comes. The prophetic nature of God will be unleashed upon your life. Prophets and the prophetic man, it's a subject that every Christian needs to know like the back of their hand because it's what the future of the church is going to be all about. Beginning now, 
So get on board and stop calling people false prophet just because you don't have a prophetic bone in your body because of ignorance. You didn't know, but now you know. And we're going to go deeper tomorrow night and deeper the night after and deeper the next night. And we're going to go deeper until we touch the bottom of a mountain or a valley and rise up to walk in the newness of life. Father, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I rebuke every power of darkness that says to the people you will never prophesy. I curse that spirit that tells them they are not prophetic, that there's nothing that they can do to ever become prophetic. And for those who have had the spirit of prophecy on them, and uh, they have turned away because of fear of personality types, tonight we repent of running away from your calling. We turn around and obey your call. We will not be rebellious anymore. Oh, rock a shocker. We will not allow fear and rebellion to cause us to run from the prophetic call. We submit our lives to you, Lord. We submit our tongue to speak your word. We submit our eyes to see your vision. We submit our lives to bring a prophetic voice to the nation. We accept our assignment and the grace that we would need to fulfill it. We will not be a Jonah running away to Tarshish. We will go to our Nineveh. We will speak your word. Let any trouble that we have experienced in running from the call leave our lives and leave our lives now in the name of Jesus. Go, go, scram, beat it. Vamos, get out of Dodge, get out of town. Move, be gone. We cast you out from them in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Every trouble that has come upon that woman, that man, because they have been running away from the prophetic grace that is upon their life, I command that trouble to cease and desist. Cease and desist. Every embargo put upon their lives. Every embargo put upon our lives. We break the embargo. We curse it and command that they will be access to things that they have been shut off from. In the name of Jesus, loose them. Loose them, devil. Loose them. Loose them. Loose them. Be gone. Scram. Get out of Dodge. Name of Jesus. We will speak your word. Let your peace return in our lives. The peace that we lost when we refused to say what the Lord said. Let your joy return to our lives. Because the joy of the Lord is our strength. I renounce and turn away from any behavior that is contrary to the prophet's call upon my life. I turn away from any religious tradition that keeps me from obeying this call. I will not be afraid to do what I have been sent to do by the Lord my God in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I submit to his call. Oh yes, yes. Now we're going to make a... I, we're going to make prophetic commands. Prophetic commands. We're doing it now. You say what I say. Yes. Cabo Shah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I command any spirit that would attack you at night to leave now. All spirits of insomnia and restlessness. Go. Go. Get out. I pray that you will be healed from hurt. From pastors, churches, networks, family and friends. Fair weather friends and frenemies. I pray that you will be healed from any betrayal and treachery. I pray that you will be delivered from false friends and false brethren and false ministers, false leaders. I command all spirits of disappointment to leave in the name of Jesus. Disappointment with pastors, with churches, with the saints. Go! Spirit of offense, get out! Out! Out in the name of Jesus. Out, get out, get out, leave. Loose, scram, beat it, get out, be gone, go, go! Go! In the name of Jesus, go! Get out! Out! Keep going! Name of Jesus. Oh yes, I pray that your joy will be restored and your joy will be full, that the zeal of the Lord will be restored to you, that the fresh anointing to prophesy would come on you like, like, like a gushing rain in the name of Jesus. Hey, yeah, 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 yeah. I pray that a fresh anointing to dream and have visions will come upon you. Anything blocking or hindering you from the prophetic flow is now removed out of your life. In the name of Jesus, go! Let the dam that is blocking the flow of the Holy Spirit be removed. I move that dam out because I have upon my life penetrating power. I penetrate that dam. I break the dam down now in the name of Jesus. Go, go, move aside and let the water of God's prophetic flow flow into their, into their lives, flow into the church, flow into the ministry. Let it come like a gushing gully of water fresh from the throne of God in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Oh yes. Oh yes. 
I pray that your ears will be opened. I pray that your eyes will see and anything blocking you, stopping you, hindering you from hearing the voice of the Lord, be moved out of the way in the name of Jesus. In the name of Yeshua the Messiah, come out of that house, come out of that family, come out of that bloodline, go, scram, get out. Let the prophetic flow break forth upon their lives in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Let ears be unplugged. Let ears be unplugged. Let nostrils be unplugged so they can have that insight and discernment from the Lord. Let the river of living water flow out of your belly. Let the prophetic bubble and gush come out of you. Let the word of the Lord drop from heaven on you like dew. Let the word fall like rain upon your life. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, rock a shock. I'm feeling it tonight. My God, my God. I pray that you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. I pray that your cup will overflow. That you'll be filled with the Holy Ghost boldness. We'll be unafraid of men and their nonsense in the name of... Come out of your cave. Come out now. Come out now. Come out. Come out of that cave. Come out of that. Come out of that cave. Come out. Come out. Come out. 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 Out in the name of Jesus. Out. I pray that you'll be filled with the wisdom of God. The wisdom of God will fill you for every assignment that you go out on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, rock a shocker again. Let God arise and the enemy be scattered. I pray tonight that job opportunities will open up. That those who have been sent home, those who have been off jobs, off work for weeks and months, that those will open up now. You can't do that, Rev. Yes, I can. I open up those doors. I rise up with apostolic anointing and supernatural penetrating power and I command doors to open now. Doors for jobs with good pay and a good supervisor not very far away from home so they don't have to spend hours driving to work and hours driving from work. No, no, no. Jobs that are near with a good paycheck and a good decent supervisor that will treat them like the gift that they are in the name of Jesus. I command it. I demand it. I demand it. Christ paid for it with his precious blood and said we shall have life and have it more abundantly. We cannot have abundant life when we are broke, out of work, whatever, whatever. So everything that has to happen to make the abundant overflow of God's blessing and life come to us, let it happen now. Open doors, 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 open doors. Let jobs come knocking. Yeah, 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 yeah. Whoo! Yes. Woo! <laughs> you know, some nights when I'm done here, I know that I have delivered the baby that I'm supposed to deliver, and I feel light. And then after that light feeling, I feel like I can go eat an elephant. There's an elephant downstairs, it's cooked. How do you eat an elephant, Rev? One bite at a time. <laughs> One bite at a time. Whatever it is tonight, there is something in the message for everybody. I trust that you will get your part. And that you will never be the same with regard to the prophetic flow of God upon your life in the authority of Jesus' mighty name. Let God arise and the enemy be scattered away from your life. May God make your blessing and bless you in a way that you never would have anticipated in Jesus' name. Oh yeah, somebody shout a good amen. Have a good night, y'all. This is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be prophetic in it. Yes and yes.